Shalom. Welcome to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio today by Mark Finkelstein of the Jewish Community Relations Commission for the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. And we will be joined on Skype uh, in a few minutes uh, by Carl Wilkins, um, who will be uh, sharing with us uh, his story about Rwanda, staying behind in Rwanda. Excuse me, my nose uh, was about to sneeze there. Uh, and um, all his work in saving hundreds of, of orphans uh, and other children in Rwanda during the genocide. An absolutely wonderful person. Um, we also work together um, uh, in our efforts uh, to help the people of Sudan combat genocide in that country. And so uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit about combating genocide in other places around the world as well. The big topic that's uh, going on this week is the continuing ratcheting up of tensions uh, in North Korea with South Korea. Uh, and while there are certainly lots of jokes about um, uh, the, the uh, leader of North Korea sending transformers, his transformer toys to the border to fight and, and, all, and uh, people wanting to give him a Snickers bar so he can turn in from the mad tyrant to the guy who did Gangnam Style. Um, the, 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 jokes, the jokes are good, but the situation really isn't. And um, we try to make light of situations through our humor. Uh, this is a situation that is not very light, and um, we really are concerned that hostilities could break out. The United States has sent uh, a significant amount of of military assets into the region uh, to use uh, uh, in a potential conflict. South Korea has, has dramatically increased its military awareness. North Korea ha is, is basically on full alert. And the problem with that kind of situation is very little could happen and tip it over into actual combat. Um, so we hope that cooler heads will prevail and the situation in North and South Korea and the border region there um, will uh, be much better next we talk next week. Um, the situation in the Middle East uh, regarding uh, Syria and Iran remains unchanged. Uh, there really is not much of any information that has come up. Uh, and uh, the 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 big information, really, the big news this week, really, is that it seems that there is a push to try to get some sort of negotiations uh, uh, off the off the ground um, from the perspective of the United States uh, working with Israel. Uh, the The possibilities still appear to be relatively limited as far as how that's going to go. Uh, there's now even more turmoil in the Palestinian Authority with Salam Fayyad evidently uh, tendering his resignation over some conflict about uh, a deputy advisor or something along those lines. And so um, that situation clearly would have to be resolved before the Palestinian Authority could even negotiate because the uh, even negotiate with Western representatives because the Western representatives really have more confidence in Salam Fayyad than they have in the Palestine, in the rest of the Palestinian Authority leadership. So uh, we are uh, in a situation where there's lots of different things that we could talk about, and we will be talking about them in the next few weeks. Um, we have a wonderful article that I'd love to share with you if we have some time later on in the show. Um, from Ahmed Hashimi, um, who wrote that anti-Semitism is why the Arab Spring failed. It's a great article that's found in the Times of Israel. Uh, if we don't get to it today, I hope that you will uh, take some time and look it up. Um, and uh, the, the interesting situation here is, and, and the sad situation here, is really that as people, uh, as the Arab world is finding more freedom uh, from tyranny, uh, they're also finding more opportunity to espouse anti-Semitism and, and in, the, in, the, uh, in the guidelines of theocracy. And uh, the, the Islamism that has risen in the region not only is impacting places like Sudan, where there's ongoing genocide, but it's, it's becoming more and more to impact uh, the lives of Arab citizens throughout the region. We'll talk more about that uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you. That's the world in five minutes. 
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture. Um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going though, I like this. <laughs> Just give us a try. I'm gonna take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. Shalom, welcome back to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein of the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. And uh, we're going to be joined shortly uh, by Skype uh, by Carl Wilkins. Um, Carl Wilkins, as a humanitarian aid worker, uh, moved his family to Rwanda in the spring of 1990. Uh, when the genocide was launched in 1994, Carl refused to leave, even when urged by his friends, his family, uh, his church, and the United States government. Uh, most of, uh, most all, in fact, all of uh, the United States citizens uh, left the country. Carl was the only one left. And uh, he went out each day into the streets uh, filled with uh, mortars and gunfire, uh, working his way through roadblocks and all kinds of other um, uh, problematic things that were going on there, uh, bringing food, water, and medicine to groups of orphans trapped around the city. Uh, his actions saved the lives of hundreds of people. Carl returned to the United States in 1996 after being featured in the 2004 PBS Frontline documentary, Ghosts of Rwanda, about the Rwanda genocide. And he began to receive all kinds of inquiries to have him speak and, uh, and other things. In January of 2008, with no end in sight to the ongoing genocide in Darfur, Carl uh, decided to quit his job and dedicate himself full-time to accepting these invitations. He and his wife, Teresa, have since formed an educational nonprofit, World Outside My Shoes, to facilitate this important work. And it's an honor uh, to have Carl Wilkins join us by Skype this morning. Hello, Carl. How are you? Morning, Dave. How are uh, Doing well, thanks. How are you doing? Uh, good. I think we need to get our headphones on here. Thanks, Just a second. Well. All right. The sun is just coming up here in San Diego. 
It's a gorgeous morning. I hope you've got nice weather wherever you are. <laughs> well, we, we have uh, cold and uh, overcast skies today. Yeah, ni nice is not <laughs> how I would describe it here in Des Moines, but uh, I'm glad it's, glad it's wonderful in San Diego. I think, that, I think that's part of what, why people live in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. You know, I asked them yesterday, is it always like this? And they said, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see it looks like it's glowing behind you. Uh, yeah. So, so um, it, we're, we're looking forward to having you come uh, to, to Iowa on April 20th as well and, and uh, having you speak at the temple uh, April 20th at 7.30 uh, p.m. That's Temple B'nai Jeshurun 5101 Grand for those in Des Moines for those who are uh, interested in coming. Um, but tell us a little bit about uh, your story. Well, um I, f I fell in love with Africa as a college kid. I had a great service learning program and went to the Trans Sky uh, in South Africa in the 70s and, and came back, married this beautiful woman who said, I'll go anywhere. And we spent six years in Zimbabwe, Zambia, you know, right out of college. Our daughters are born there. And, and um, then we got this opportunity to work in Rwanda. In 1990, we moved to Kigali. Um, with this, uh, with the Adventist Development Relief Agency, as you mentioned there in the introduction, building schools. Six months after we got there, um, the war a war started. Um, went on for three years. Our work shifted a bit to include all the displaced people who were being chased out of the, their homes by the war. And uh, then we came. What we thought was going to be an end and a new beginning in Rwanda with this war over Arusha Peace Accord. But there was a small group of people who said, you know, we will never share power. And there was the beginning of this horrific genocide that uh, engulfed the country there in 94. And what was it like to, to, be, to be alone as a Westerner during the genocide? I, 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 have, I have difficulty imagining what it would be like to be behind, in, behind the lines and to do that kind of work during a genocide. And... And, and what was it like with the, the orphans and the children and, and having to go through roadblocks with, with food? And how, how come you were able to do that, that people didn't go after you as well? Well, there were times that they did threaten to kill me, but that wasn't uh, most of the time, fortunately. Um, they, they uh, let's see, to be left alone, I never felt alone. There, there were actually 10 of us... Um, easily identifiable foreigners. Five Catholic Sisters of Charity from Spain, two Catholic fathers, German Frenchmen, um, a, another Frenchman who stayed with his orphans, and, and a Swiss man with the Red Cross, Philip Gaillard. Uh, but, but aside from those few foreigners, I mean, yeah, there were six or seven thousand before, um, but, but aside from them, you know, Africa had been our home for ten years, and so our colleagues were there, friends were there, um, neighbors, of course, still there. Uh, we'd been living there for four years already. Our kids have been playing with the neighborhood kids. So I think, you know, never really alone. Um, but, but then in terms of being able to do something during this horrible time, it, it really came down to relationships. Um, when I was talking with some students at, here at San Diego State University last night, guy spent eight years in the Marines, and um, he's asking me, you know, Come on, how, how just your presence, how could that really, you know, make it happen? Because I'm sure he's thinking from a military mindset, you know, you got to have a strategy, you got to have all the different things in place, logistics and huge amount, you know, to be able to have a successful mission. And, you know, I just kind of shook my head and I said, it was really about relationships, relationships with the people who were in charge, formed a relationship with the guy who was in charge of the city. He's He's in prison now for genocide, crimes against humanity, be there for the rest of his life, um, relationships with guys at the roadblocks, um, guys to, you know, find some powdered milk at the market and, and ask this little lady who's selling, you know, where'd you get that? I need a hundred times that. I mean, she would, she would connect me with usually a soldier and a civilian who, um, who had a stack, a stash of stolen powdered milk and I'd make a deal with them. It was, yeah, it was just... Uh, relationships. Mark has a question. Uh, hi, Carl. Carl, can okay. I ask you, the nature of the people you met there, were, were you in the middle of two different ethnic groups to begin with? Or, well, or? I'm really, really glad you asked because a lot of times when people try to get their you know, hands around a situation that's foreign to us, 
um, you're trying to figure out who's who and what labels apply and stuff. And people heard Hutu as the majority, Tutsi as the minority. But in reality, in Rwanda, they married each other by the thousands. I mean, it was so typical for a person with one ID card to marry someone with the other ID card. And then their kids are going to have the ID card of their dad. And, and, and so the, there really weren't these huge differences that a lot of people like to explain there. In fact, I honestly, many of my uh, neighbors, colleagues, I didn't know if they had a Hutu ID card or Tutsi ID card before the genocide for many of them. So um, this was really a politically driven event that, that um, you know, won't go into all the history, but, but that worked to construct an enemy and, and, um, and for them the target worked best for, you know, various reasons as the, the politicians were being threatened by the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which was mostly Tutsi, and then even other Hutu parties threatened them. So this genocide was their solution to get rid of the threat, both all of the Tutsis and any moderate Hutus who didn't go along with their extremist ideology. Uh, Carl, were there any uh, external groups of people, whether neighboring countries or the United States or other major powers who had an influence on either uh, of the, the parties involved? Oh, absolutely. The, the government of France um, had long-term relationships, economic, political, social relationships with the people of Rwanda. You know, I, um, I, I feel like in, in so many crises around the world, we've got to ask the question you just asked, you know, who are their partners? Who has influence with them? And um, without a doubt, the French and the Belgian, I mean, it had been a Belgian colony, but France over the years too had, had started to play a more major, major role to the fact that, to the extent that they were training the Rwandan military uh, at the beginning of the war, it was French artillery that just really nearly destroyed the Rwandan Patriotic Front. So w without a doubt, um, that was a significant uh, relationship that, that could have been used to stop the genocide. And, and then um, the United Nations was already in the country. And so, you know, after World War II, the whole world is saying, you know, this should not happen. Never again should families be slaughtered like this. And we all sign on, you know, a convention there at the UN. And now we've got this genocide erupting in Rwanda. We've got 2,500 UN soldiers on the ground. And, and, and we vote to take them out, which, which is not just a simple vote, but it, but it is a simple reality that we had enough soldiers on the ground to have stopped this in the first days, and we voted to withdraw them. You know, what parallels, this is Rabbi Kaufman, what parallels do you see with what's going on in Sudan? I know we do a lot of work in when, what went on in Darfur, uh, and I read earlier uh, in, in your bio that, that you saw what was going on in Darfur and you decided to devote yourself to this kind of work. Um, what do you see as a parallel between what's going, what went on in Rwanda, what's going on in Darfur? And, and I'm particularly interested in the world's response. You know, I, one of the, I, I have to say, one of the questions that I asked my confirmation students, my 10th grade students this week as we were studying the Holocaust, is when we say never again, what does that mean? What, what does that obligate us to do as opposed to just say? If we just say it, it doesn't mean much. What do we have to do to make that mean something? Yeah. Um, you know, Darfur is uh, a genocide been going on there for nearly 10 years. It, some people say kind of like Rwanda, but in slow motion. Uh, each place is obviously unique and different. And, and innocent people are caught up in the struggle of political powers, vying for power, you know. Um, but, but in terms of our response, what we can do, um, I, you know, nobody really loves this word responsibility except to throw it at somebody else, you know. It's your responsibility, it's your responsibility. So, so I ask that we, that we cut the word in half and turn it around. Ability to respond. And then we start thinking about what is our role? What is our gifts? What are our abilities? Um, whether it's something with the social media, and, um, and we need to help educate people on the stories. And we're putting a link on our Facebook page and we're, we're sharing or we're making a video clip with friends or, you know, we're, we're helping to get the story out there. That's, that's something that has happened with Darfur, um, but did not, did not um, you know, uh, uh, happen that, that much with Rwanda. Um, we're, we're definitely getting a much 
uh, much broader response in Darfur, but it's still, you know, nowhere near what we need because it's been going on for, for 10 years. And so, um, you know, I, it's easy to say never again is meaningless. And I, and I would say, wait, we need to stop and look, you know, what happened Ivory Coast here a while back, a couple of years ago in Kenya, you know, down in Zimbabwe. Are there times that Zimbabwe, ha sorry, that genocide has been stopped? I really do think it, it, it has happened. But, but those times when it has happened have been when um, I think it's a concerted effort, grassroots movements together with high level uh, government leaders making it a priority and physically flying to the place, putting their feet on the ground, um, you know, making that physical presence known that, that has made a difference. I, I've been really encouraged by the student movement. It's, it's rising and kind of falling at times and rising again as kids graduate and come into school and stuff. But STAND, you know, the student movement um, against genocide, uh, the Enough Project and, and other student, uh, well, Enough isn't all student, but other projects, they are making a difference. They're giving us opportunities. The question is now, will we engage? When the ability to respond is there, whether it's with conflict minerals in the Congo, you know, and, and paying attention what company we buy our laptop or cell phone from, or, or whether it is, uh, you know, uh, an advocacy campaign on Capitol Hill, tools are there. 1-800-GENOCIDE, that's a tool that's there. Anybody can call that number and their voice can be heard in D.C. So, so some tools are coming, you know, and, and the question is now, are we, are, do we have the will Will we take the time to use some of those tools that are that are in place? Once one stops genocide, what's the next step? Uh, I think Rwanda is giving us fabulous examples of what that next step is. Um, we, you know, it's it's the ninth fastest growing economy in the world right now. Low corruption rate. You know, near a, a city of nearly two million, and a mugging is nearly unheard of. It's rare. You know, in a city, much less a murder. And and what is that? I think been built on has been restoring the judicial system. That's been a very huge part. And and. Rwanda said, and I know this might not be a typical answer to a question, what do we do after genocide? But one of the smart things that Rwanda did was in their new constitution, they said 30% of our decision makers in government will be women. And so as a result, 56% of the seats in parliament are held by women in Rwanda. And that role of women, that, that voice of a mother that says, it's going to be all right, you know, I'm not going anywhere, we're going to make it. Um, is translating into, into huge both economic boom and um, accountability in government and, and um, a decentralization of government that's happening. You know, in Rwanda, the leadership of President Kagame is telling the people, look, this is your country. The answers to the problems are in your hands, not from somebody outside. Partners from outside, absolutely, really valuable. But the real final solution for our, our troubles here are in the hands of you, the people. So one of the things the government does is gets the spending decisions closer and closer to the grassroots level, not in the five provincial levels, but down at the 30 district levels and not satisfied with that, on down to the 400 and some sector levels. So I think that that uh, sense among the people that, that you are the solution is a huge part to um, recovering from genocide and, and we could talk, too, about the gachacha, you know, and about the confession of the perpetrators and a lot of programs that have been in, uh, put in place in Rwanda by the government, by churches, nonprofit organizations, and, and, and even local community groups. But I think, you know, a justice system, I think the role of women in playing in the new government and a sense of this is our country, our fate is in our hands, are, are three key things that, that we've, we're seeing modeled in Rwanda. Uh, Carl, what do the children understand about what happened? <laughs> really good question. You know, I was in Rwanda in January with a group of theater students from Buffalo State College. And at the end of the visit, I, I got an email from a 19-year-old young man in Rwanda. He says, could, could I meet with you, you know, before you? And I was just about to fly out. And actually, about two hours before I flew out, we met for a while. Sharp kids, you know, and he's like, um, I was just born at the time of the genocide, and, and I do ask my parents and I ask others, but, you know, just like any place in the world, some people are really reticent to talk about it. Others are more willing. He says, you were here. Tell me. There's this 
there's this hunger among the young people, um, especially, you know, at college age, as they're beginning to wrestle with different things of their past and, and what's in the future. And um, while, the, while the education program is working on helping inform them, Kigali Genocide um, Memorial, Kigali Genocide Center has a fantastic exhibit and they bring students in every week through there with Aegis Trust and, and, and collaboration with the Kigali Genocide Center. Um, and I'm, I was just on a conference call two nights ago with a group of teachers here in America who are working to facilitate um, uh, to help the Rwandan teachers in, in how to go about teaching about the genocide. But, you know, even though it's 19 years ago, super sensitive when every kid in your classroom is either related to someone who died or someone who did the killing. And so one of the ways that it's been approached in Rwanda is let's learn about the Holocaust. And as we learn about the Holocaust, it's not the genocide right there, your genocide in your face, but it's this event that happened years ago, but all of a sudden you begin to see these parallels. And, and so, um, so efforts are, are definitely being made, intentional efforts, uh, both formally for, for kids and then, and then the young people themselves. You know, I'll get emails uh, pretty much several times a month from some other young person in Rwanda thanking me for staying there, which, you know, is really nice email to receive, but, but then asking the questions. And they're, they're, um, they're beginning to tell their stories through films um, and through, you know, books. And, and so that's a great opportunity for us to partner with the people of Rwanda to help them share their stories with the rest of the world. And uh, we can do that Facebook and so many other ways. Ms. Wonder, we're, we're going to need to take a short break here in a minute, but after our break, Carl, I'd, I'd love for you to talk about what it is that you teach about the Holocaust specifically. What, what resonates with, um, with the people in Rwanda? What resonates with these students uh, who are wanting to learn about their own genocides in Africa? You and I both work uh, in dealing with Sudan also and the genocide that's ongoing in the Nuba Mountains and genocide in Darfur. Um, and and uh, I, th I think it's important for us to get into that. Uh, what is what can we can we learn from the Holocaust, and what can we um, what can what really helps teaching people uh, to stop it from happening again? We'll talk about that after a short break. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drink. Dance party. Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with Birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about Birthday Fridays at KittiesUSA.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 
Shalom. Welcome to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Fingelstein of the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines, and we're joined by Skype by Carl Wilkins. Um, before we continue our conversation, I'd like to thank our benefactor, sponsor for this show, Dr. Ronald Bergman of Bergman Folkers Cosmetic Surgery and Spa, uh, for his uh, all his support of this show and what we do, enabling us to have uh, wonderful guests on our show and, and to have uh, this great studio and this opportunity to uh, to share with you um, thoughts from wonderful people like Carl Wilkins. So, uh, Carl, I, I asked before the break about the Holocaust and, and what you teach and what you think it's important for the students to understand and what they find important uh, in their own understanding. Can, can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, a little bit, actually, only because um, I haven't been in the classrooms that much in Rwanda. You know, I've, so, so what I'll share with you is kind of secondhand from talking with teachers who are there and then a few experiences that, that I've had. I mean, I, I remember particularly um, one day uh, I was with some elementary school teachers in Rwanda. One of these ladies had been teaching for 40 years. So when you think about that, hmm, back up 40 years, 1962, boy, that's right at the time Rwanda got independence. So imagine all things that this that this primary school teacher in Rwanda had seen in her life, the, the violence that had happened in Rwanda in the late 50s and into the 60s, again, against Tutsi people, um, all these things she had witnessed. And each day, you know, she's going to her simple little African classroom teaching. And as we, as we talked with her about the Holocaust, um, because she had learned about it over her career and stuff as a teacher in Rwanda, um, I think one of the things that was really important was that the people in Rwanda learned that um, they're not alone and people have, people have had a life after something as terrible as this. Because, you know, when you survive and you lose, um, you know, so much, if not all of your family, what's the point of living, many people ask, you know? And, and so for them to see the stories and to see how the survivors of the Holocaust have gone on to develop GPS systems and to have lives and, and, and to also be part of education to build peace in the world, I think that after has been a huge encouragement for, for um, the people of Rwanda who are looking at that after. Um, I think that also, you know, there was a big connection, you know, understanding um, that, that this idea of hatred and us and them, you know, is not unique to Rwanda. Rwanda is not some cursed population group, but this is a human problem all around the world. The idea that my world would be better without you in it. And, and so, so, you know, connecting with a government that was going, you know, sponsored executions, Holocaust, Rwanda, they, they draw the parallels you know, all over the place, as well as, there, you know, that there are many differences. But I think just that sense of we're not alone um, and uh, there is hope afterwards. And, you know, we can join in the core of people who are working to make this a genocide-free world. Um, you know, those are some of the things that I hear and, and, and heard. I just, I wish I could show you this beautiful lady's face. She must have been, you know, into her 60s still teaching school in Rwanda, and I'm thinking, boy, the world needs to hear from this lady, and I'm sure she'd love to sit down, well, like we did with the teacher's conference with a Holocaust survivor, and you should have seen the Rwandan students. It was a Skype, and they were coming up to the flat screen TV and asking their questions of this lady, and, you know, and seeing just, wow, how, how much they shared in common with this, with this lady, you know, Skyping from Washington, D.C., who had survived um, Auschwitz. Now, do, do they have some sort of museum um, uh, yeah. kind of thing for the Rwandan genocide that, that highlights yeah. individual actions? I mean, I, I found Absolutely. kind of the individuals, uh, the individual stories are so important. Yeah. Huge. Um, Huge. It, you know, if you go online to Kigali Genocide Center or Kigali Genocide Memorial, you will find... Um, a great website, a link to their to their um, main museum education center to the genocide in Kigali, and then throughout the country there are both just physical memorials like you know all of the mass graves and things like that. But then there's other um, 
memorials, educational memorials. Morambi is a very powerful one. That's a very, a very, um, how can I say, provocative. It, it, it causes a lot of discussion because they've actually preserved some of the remains there. And and um, and so no, they're they're making efforts. Churches that have had slaughters happen in them. You know, they've respectfully buried the bones at these churches, but one of the churches, all of the benches that served as pews are covered still with the clothing of the people who lost their lives there. So, you know, these memorials are, are available um, all around the country. And I mean, you asked about the kids, you know, and what they know about it. I remember visiting the church there and there's, there with these, with the clothes and the mass graves and and outside, walking right past it every day, two precious little first graders, hand in hand in their sharp little school uniform. You know, they walk past this church every day on their way to school. So in, so in many ways, they know about it as a part of life. And then in other ways, though, the question is always, why, how? And, and you know, unpacking those questions are the big challenges. Uh, Carl, what type of mental health services are available to people there? Um, wide, a wide spectrum. I mean, you know, people have come in from the West wanting to, to help with many good intentions. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's helped and sometimes it hasn't. Um, I, I can't really speak in detail from experience to the, to the mental health that's provided both, you know, from the government level and the nonprofit organizations. What I can speak more to is the type of mental health treatment that happens in everyday life in Rwanda. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, in many Western countries, when a tragedy happens, our home is broken into, somebody is killed, we, we have the luxury, at least the choice, to move to another house, perhaps even to another town or another country. In Rwanda, the people don't have that luxury. And, um, and so they have to, just because of poverty and other challenges, um, they have to deal with this. And, and for example, um, your neighbor, she may be taking food to her husband who's in prison because of genocide, and she might ask you to watch over her kids. And you're like, you know, you're maybe a survivor. You don't want anything to do with this family and what they took from you, and it could just overwhelm you. But then you look at the kids, and you go, wow, you know, sure, I'll watch your kids. What, what did they have to do with this? And that whole idea of for our children has been a strong factor in Rwanda in, in um, forcing, I guess you could say in many ways, people to learn how to live together again. And in that learning how to live together again, I think they are finding healing in their heads and in their hearts. They're beginning to redefine people, not just as killers, but again, as neighbors, as a co-worker in the rice cooperative, you know, I might not want to work alongside, I may not want to hoe alongside this person, but, but um, for the sake of my family, for, um, you know, get a school uniform for my kids, we've got to do this. And, and um, so I think that kind of forced by life and necessity, um, sharing of whether it's gardens or, or, you know, somebody has one solar panel and everybody's sharing off of it to charge their cell phone, that daily living together, I think, is bringing some healing. But, but, you know, for those of us who don't speak Kenya Rwanda, aren't living there today, um, we really only have a tiny glimpse of still the huge amount of healing that uh, I'm sure still needs to take place. And, and so, you know, I'm a big believer in the power of stories. And, and again, I would make the appeal that we can partner with the Rwandans to help them tell their stories. And as they tell their stories, you know, I, I just don't know so much about formal part of mental health, but I think the practical day-to-day -day helping people tell their stories, listening, letting them know their stories are important. For me, that's been an important part of my healing. When uh, we talk about uh, the Holocaust and when we go through the museum, one of the, the major um, uh, mottos of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is what you do matters. Um, and you know, what you do as an individual matters. And, and in the Jewish tradition, we talk about tikkun olam and repair of the world. Uh, but for me, the, the, the statement, uh, the two statements that really stand out when we're talking about uh, dealing with these kind of issues, these overwhelming issues, um, is you, one, you can't stand idly by. 
uh, the blood of your the blood of your neighbor. And the other one is um, though. Uh, w- while you can't finish the work, uh, neither can you desist from it. You, if if the if the task is so large that you say, how can I possibly do all of this? Uh, you still can't avoid doing something because your individual action matters. And, uh, and so I try to teach people that, that, that they need to do something. They can't just do nothing. And so my question is, when we're dealing with um, not only individuals, but we're dealing with governments, you know, what, 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 what could uh, the, the governments have done that would have made a difference? And what can they do, uh, say, in, in dealing with Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile and Darfur, uh, that can make a difference. Samantha Power, um, I, I know you know this, Samantha Power said basically, here's, here's a whole long list of why the United States has never done anything about genocide and it doesn't look like we're going to do anything about it anytime soon either. What, what, do, we need to, what do we need to do um, to have happen uh, in your mind uh, to get action? You know, I, I think I'd, I'd like to take the two parts. You're talking about the... the um the personal part and the government part, and see how those two parts actually fit together. How can we rehumanize the government? Um, there's, there's a great campaign I just caught on to that was from last year where uh, a graphic designer in Israel said, you know, we're about to go to war for 10 years now with Iran. I've got to do something. And he made this poster. So you Google, um, Iran, we love you. We will not bomb you. And you had a people's response to what's going on between their two countries and all of a sudden the people's movement started on the um, on the grassroots level connecting people from Israel with people from Iran you know they said we want to have coffee well it's kind of hard so they took two pictures facing each other on on Facebook of having you know a cup of coffee and this guy with a cup of coffee and, and those are just some visual images but I thought to myself hmm can this man from Israel actually tell the people in Iran we will not bomb you and and if somebody does bomb Iran or Iran bombs Israel, um, is that the people's action? Is that the government? I think we've had for too long a huge separation between the idea of, well, the government should do this and, well, what should we as individuals do? And we've got to find a way that those two come together. And I think that, um, that some specifics that could have happened in Rwanda, for example, that could have been people grassroots driven would have been... Um, say another radio station during the time of the Rwandan genocide. They argued over the technicalities of blocking the hate radio, which in Rwanda was huge for carrying out the genocide. I mean, logistically, we haven't seen, say, you know, Bill Smith uh, lately, but somebody thinks they saw him down by the 7-Eleven on the corner of Elm and 2nd, and his license plate number is this. I mean, the radio was so specific in carrying out the genocide. And so while we're arguing about the freedom of speech and blocking that hate radio in the country, what about broadcasting another radio? Right now, um, we're seeing how, how cell phones in every picture you see, whether it's in the Middle East or Africa or wherever, where there's trouble, you see somebody who's, who's holding up their cell phone, you know, and they're taking a picture of this. And so I think um, we can connect more with our governments. Guy in Kenya a Kenyan wrote a software program before these most recent elections preparing in case there was violence that they'd be able to take all the influx of text messages from different parts of the country and be able to respond. So I'm talking a lot of different ideas here, but I think, you know, the principle I would like to see happen would be uh, a re-engaging uh, a sense of ownership that a government is really me and, and um, that I can through, you know, here in America, build a relationship with our, with our senators, with our representatives. Actually, we probably won't build a, representative, a relationship directly with them, but we can build a relationship with their staff, with their legislative assistant for foreign affairs, that 28-year-old young lady who's passionate about changing the world, you know. We can build those relationships with them. And then, you know, we'll see, as I said earlier, Who's the economic partners? Who's the political, cultural, you know, partners here, uh, military partners? And, and how can we encourage them, you know, to use their influence to, to diffuse or bring peace to an area? Whatever. We have to take a short break. Uh, and after our break, I think we'll give you, uh, we'll give you a, f- a few minutes to, to just give us uh, what you want us to take away from this. 
um, what your your advice uh, that that we should keep in our hearts. And, sure. Um, uh, so we'll be back in just about in just a minute. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Shalom. Welcome back to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein, and we're joined by Skype by Carl Wilkins, uh, who has been sharing uh, his stories uh, with us uh, and, and educating us on uh, what he believes uh, will help make the world a better place, basically. Uh, I'm sitting here looking at a screen in our studio, Carl, I have to tell you, and right above the screen it says it's a God thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, speaking as a rabbi to a, to a minister here, um, you know, a lot of this work that we do, and I think the work we do in our personal lives and the work we do in anti-genocide and other things is about that. It's, it's motivated by uh, making the world a better place and seeing kind of a bigger picture um, and uh, I kind of wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, uh, give us a little bit of advice uh, from your perspective, not only about how to combat genocide, but um, uh, one, of the, one of the big things I see on your website is this idea of reaching out to the other, and I wanted to um, sure. you know, get, uh, give you the opportunity to say a few words about that as well. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. You know, um, when uh, this morning I'll be in some class rooms here and uh, last night was others and and always share this story about these Rwandan women who came and stood in front of our gate the second night of the genocide and stopped the killers from coming into our house not that we were particularly targeted but in the chaos they were doing whatever they wanted and and um, these ladies were only armed with stories they weren't armed with machetes or guns they just simply told them stories about our family our kids playing with their kids and, and I've become very passionate about the power of stories to build peace. And, you know, stories, we hope, will always inspire people to action. And, and action has this way of empowering stories. If we don't have the stories, the action becomes duty. It becomes drudgery, and, and we get burned out. And yet, if we only do stories and there's no action, they become meaningless. And, and so when people ask, you know, what can we do, I'm always saying, we've got to learn the story, learn the back story, you know, and, and, and say, well, it's so complex. Sure, life's complex, but learn the story of an individual and then of another individual and another individual. And those stories are often right at next door, you know. It, it may be a refugee family from Somalia, you know, or it may be a professor who is from West Africa, you know. The stories are all around us besides being on the web. And, and you know, learning the story also takes the ability to listen, listen without an agenda, not learning the story so I can pinch you or, or promote my agenda, but just simply listening, learning the story for the value of the story. And then as we do, I think the opportunities will come along that, that we can partner with 
the people as we're learning their stories. Not do stuff for people, but with people, partner, and especially in international situations, they have to take the lead. And, and so I don't believe that people don't care. I really don't. I believe that we're wired to care. The problem is we don't always have the tools. We don't know how to care. You know, somebody's broken on the side of the road. Well, I can help them change a tire, you know, or, or I got my cell phone. I can call and get some help. But in genocide, we're like, what do we do? And, and so I say, start simple. Stories, stories of individuals. And then as we learn their story, how can we partner? You know, maybe our passion is soccer. I just met a couple of weeks ago with a couple uh, I act, and, and if you look on the on web or on the YouTube, you'll see Darfur United. It's it's a football league that has been started among the refugee camps. Now it's crazy that the thing should go on so long that a football league would start there. But at the same time, the effects of this football league in in restoring a sense of unity among the people and and getting people in America who never would be involved with genocide or not because they don't care, just th their circles don't intersect. But then all of a sudden. Dar uh, soccer, football, come, well, wherever country you're in, soccer comes into the picture and all of a sudden their circles begin to intersect, you know, or we've got this great project coming in June in, in D.C. where we're going to be laying down a million bones. You look up the One Million Bones Project and, and you see how artists are coming together to respond against genocide. And, and the list could go on, you know, that theater group I took to Rwanda this summer from the group of students from Buffalo State College, they're writing a play this semester based on their two-week visit in Rwanda. And so again, they're engaging theater in the storytelling. So whatever our passions are, dance. Another friend has started a dance school in Rwanda. She, you know, where our passion, our gifts are, and where a great need of the world that touches our heart is, and where those two intersect, that's where we want to be. That's where we want to live. This is wonderful, Carl. Thank you for joining us this morning and sharing uh, all of your stories. I'm, look, I'm really looking forward to having you come to, uh, to my congregation, Temple B'nai Jeshurun in Des Moines, uh, 5101 Grand Avenue, um, April 20th. Um, Carl will be speaking at 730. Uh, all are invited. Uh, and um, uh, it, it really... Um, is uh, is heartwarming uh, to hear and inspiring to hear your stories, not only of what you did, but what other people do uh, when they're faced with real difficulty. Uh, I'm going to be leaving uh, in a few minutes the studio here to go back to my congregation where I'm teaching a class on anti-Semitism, the history of anti-Semitism, and, and going through tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Um, and uh, it, it's... It, it, it's it's difficult to confront it constantly, but uh, you know, part of why I think you and I both do this work is because we want to, we want it, the answer to be never again. We want there to be uh, a a a stopping of this kind of action against against people and this kind of hatred and and to promote understanding between people, um, Jews, Christians, Muslims, uh, and 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 people from people from Africa of different tribes, different ethnicities. We want everybody to be able to interact because there is a common humanity that we need to stress. And when we when we can interact on that personal level, things change. Absolutely. Uh, so. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this Thanks for is, the opportunity. You're welcome. This has been Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman, and I look forward to seeing you next week.